right. Welcome to the MI Hunting Podcast. Thank you for listening as always. Thanks for tuning in. So it is 2024. The regular whitetail season has ended here in Michigan. So this episode is basically going to be a season wrap up, recap, and kind of looking to or towards the, the future. Yeah, so deer season is ended through for Michigan, most of the Midwest, and states across the country. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about some or I'm going to highlight a few upcoming uh, local events here in Michigan. Highlight some of the current seasons that are still open here in Michigan as well. So there are still some hunting and fishing opportunities. Again, we're going to do a season recap. And then talk briefly a little bit about doing some winter habitat work and scouting. But before we get into it, as always, make sure if you like this video hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, share the show with your friends, and head on over to mihuntingpodcast.com where you'll get a full the full collection of all the content made available. We've got all the videos, podcast episodes, and a new blog section currently with uh, recipes that are kind of our seasonal favorites here, as well as a store with all the logo wear available. Another thing I do want to highlight too is that, again, all of these podcasts, I do also record on video as well. If you're interested in you know watching the podcast outside of just listening to it, then head on over to YouTube or Rumble. Subscribe to the Am I Honey podcast channels, and you'll be able to watch any of those podcasts. I am able to do a video component of it. Now, some of them when we're traveling or you know one like the uh, South Dakota uh, episode, you know, typically we're traveling and I don't have a good setup to be able to, you know, run video while we're on the road and whatnot. So uh, a couple of them every now and then may not have a video component to it, but the vast majority of them do, especially when it comes to talking about scouting or anything highlighted, you know, visually, you know, if you want to see what we're talking about or what I'm talking about, uh, then make sure you head on over to one of those two channels. Or you can even, again, all of those videos are available on the website. So you can go there and see the full collection as well as the, the, the regular library of uh, videos that I've put out that are uh, you know separate from the typical podcast episodes. All right, so let's get into some of these upcoming events. Uh, these are a few that are local uh, in my area, you know, here in the northern, uh, well, northwest the Northwest Lower Michigan. So these are some events that I am hoping to attend or plan to attend. Now there's a vast array of other events, especially throughout this course, or throughout the state, as well as throughout the country. These again are just from local ones. So if you are in the area, then these are some great uh, events to go to and have a good time. So the first one is the Lake Ann Brewery Company, the Big Buck Night, and that is in Lake Ann, Michigan. Again, if you're not close or not really from the area, you know, Lake Ann is a smaller town, but they've got a small brewery. And for several years now, they've hosted a big buck night. So for this year, it's on January 17th at 6 p.m. Now, it is currently too late to enter in any bucks that you might have harvested throughout the course of the season uh, for those entry time frames. Uh, for archery, you have to have it in before October 1st. And then for the rifle season, you do have to have those in before the regular rifle season starts. So November, November 14th, but you can come and see all the bucks that have been entered. Last year was the best year they've had, uh, to date with some of the biggest bucks that, uh, they've ever really hosted. Really. They also have added this year an out of state category. So if you did harvest a buck out of state and had put in for the entry, those would be available too. And now typically there's a, a group of guys that do a lot of, uh, out of state hunts and they do bring those, uh, you know, trophies with them to kind of show them off and share with the rest of the, the attendees there. So this year they've added an out of state uh, component to it, as well as this year they have a youth category. Now this one is no pre-entry required. So if you have a youth hunter that was successful this year, uh, you can bring, you know, their bucks in that would have them scored and well as highlighting uh, those, uh, you know, those bucks. Uh, during the event as well and any of the the youth that uh, enters their um, their trophy then they um, all will receive some form of prize uh, find out more uh, head on over to leak lake and slash events and i will also have that link uh, shared in the show notes or in the description if you want to look into it further 
this other one or the next one I have is one I'm very excited about is the white tails unlimited the deer camp tour uh, this is held at Traverse City Michigan at the Hagerty Center March 13th starting at 5 p.m. now the ticket deadline is or February 28th and those tickets go for $45 a piece now this one is one I'm very excited about because we've actually um, for the podcast actually been able to um, basically sponsor a table or host a table so I've got a good group of uh, guys that are going to be joining me for that event it's going to be a really good time um, again it's basically kind of set up to where a lot of your typical out your know, outdoors banquets uh, you know again they're going to of course have dinner but there's going to be an auction raffles you know telling stories and whatnot and the next one I want to highlight is one that I've attended in the past it's the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's uh, the Traverse Bay Chapter Banquet again similar I Idea as the whitetail banquet where it's basically a dinner they're going to highlight a lot of the achievements um, of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation especially for you know the Traverse City Bank or Traverse City chapter as well as kind of highlight you know the accomplishments within the state as well as uh, nationwide same idea though uh, dinner you're gonna have raffles live auction that will be held at the Park Place Hotel and Conference Center again in Traverse City and the date for that is March 2nd, starting at 5 p.m. So head on over to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's website. Head on over to their events tab. And again, if you're not local to this part of the state, then there's always events throughout the court, or throughout the state as well as across the country. Uh, all right, so let's get into some of the current seasons that are still open for here in Michigan. Now, again, there are still some locations uh, here in the state as well as across the country that are still open to deer hunting. Uh, I looked into it and there's actually still 12 states uh, across the country that are still open to either a late deer season or some specialty hunts like in CWD areas or urban or population control areas. Uh, and that's again, also including in Michigan. So there's some areas in Michigan that those that deer hunting is still um, going on. Again, make sure you check up on those regulations to make sure those areas are something that you're able to hunt in. For other hunting seasons, of course, we got the small game. So uh, rabbit season or cottontail rabbit and snowshoe hares. Squirrel season is still going on. And then, of course, you can always hunt. Uh, let's go through the list here. Uh, possum, porcupine, weasel, red squirrel, skunk, ground squirrel, woodchuck, Russian boar, feral pigeons, starlings, and house sparrows. Again, you have to have a valid... Uh, basically a base license for most of those and again double check with the regulations on any of those additional requirements and next for the fishing seasons again largemouth and smallmouth bass is catch and release that part is open year-round the possession seasons are currently closed for muskie that is open until march 15th and that is on all great lakes and inland waters and saint mary's river this excludes Lake St. Clair and the Detroit Rivers, those are catch and release only. Northern Park, Northern Pike, uh, the possession season for lower peninsula waters runs through March 15th as well. For the pos possession on Upper Peninsula, Great Lakes, Inland Waters, and St. Mary's River, that also runs through the 15th. Salmon and Trout, Great Lakes, Lake St. Clair, St. Mary's River, St. Clair and Detroit Rivers are open the entire year. And then, of course, you've got the channel catfish, flathead catfish, ciscos, whitefish, smelt, sunfish, white bass, yellow perch, and all other game species are open all year as well. Again, double check the regulations to make sure that you are in areas where fishing is allowed. All right, let's get into kind of the meat and potatoes of this episode is kind of doing the deer season wrap up and kind of recap on uh the season you know it's this year was one i probably hunted the hardest i have um probably ever really you know in, in regards to especially how much you know thought went into it I, I don't know necessarily if i hunted the you know i was in the tree or out in the woods uh hunting and you know i don't know if this year was this time I spent most time in the stand, but definitely when it came to, um, you know, thinking about hunting, my scouting, 
um, really just straining over, making sure I picked the right days and spots, as well as uh, the amount of time I spent hunting the rut. Uh, you know, that's where I really um, put a lot of my focus. And uh, it just, you know, by the time the end of the season, it did kind of start to feel like a little bit of grind. Uh, you know, I did start to feel a little bit of burnout, a little worn down. Uh, but it was one of those things where, you know, this was probably one of the weirdest seasons for me in regards to the ups and downs I had. It wasn't until this late uh, antlerless deer season that I was actually able to harvest the deer at all. Uh, you know, I had several opportunities throughout most of the season and it just didn't come to fruition. But I did end up harvesting a doe. Uh, you know, it took me about three sits even to uh, accomplish it. You know, basically this the movement was very slow. You know, again, this late end of the season is on private land only, so I focus on the, the main farm that I hunt. And uh, it just seemed like that because of the weather, you know, there's one of the nights where, you know, basically we had, you know, temperatures in the, you know, in the 40s or mid 40s. And, uh, you know, it's just, it was tough sits, I think just because those deer just didn't have that need to have to uh, get up and move like they typically would. And usually when you're looking at the late season, you know, I'm really focusing on, you know, relying on those colder temperatures, that snowfall to force deer to have to get up and feed and, you know, go to those food sources with how warm the temperatures were, you know, the amount of sunshine, it just seemed like those deer just didn't have the need to have to get up and move to find food. You know, I suspect a lot of that um, browse and stuff that's back in the cover was still available to them. And so they didn't have to go out and, you know, do a lot of traveling to get to those better food sources. So I think that weather had a lot to do with just the lack of movement and from the amount of pressure, you know, during the course of the hunting season. I mean, a lot of these deer, you're dealing with either smaller parcels or, you know, areas that get hunted pretty heavily, you know, basically through starting from October all the way up and through November. Again, the hunting pressure skyrockets here in Michigan during that time frame with the um, opening of the regular rifle season. So a lot of these deer are, you know, have been pressured for, you know, well over, you know, we're looking at two months worth. And then the fact that, you know, they aren't being pressured to have to get up and feed, it just made it tough. But was able to, you know, get it done get some meat in the freezer. So I got the processing done. Again, I do a lot of my own processing and I'm noticing that you know, at every time I do it, I just get that much better at it, that much quicker at it. You know, basically I had the entire deer, you know, that night after harvest, I had it skinned out. By the next day, I had everything deboned and uh, basically everything packaged up and in the freezer. So got about 30 pounds of burger plus the tenderloins and, uh, the venison shanks, which are one of my favorite, um, you know, kind of cuts of meat now to just kind of hang on to. Usually, you know, those shanks, you usually just cut them off the bone or cut the meat off the bone. And then you usually throw that in your grind pile. It's a really great, um, cut of meat to do like a slow cook, throw in the crock pot, handle it just like you would any other type of roast cut. Um, and that just, you know, all that connected tissue melts in that slow cooker. And it, again, it's one of my favorites to uh, do. It's a very easy meal to, to prep. And, you know, again, it's a crock pot meal. So it's easy to, to do. And, you know, it's always been a crowd pleaser uh, in our household anyways. So in already looking back at the, the season, you know, kind of doing a review of how things went and kind of, again, just you know, thinking about the season and what went wrong, what, what went well, and just overall, again, uh, it was a weird season in regards to, you know, most, most years I have, you know, pretty good success of being able to, uh, especially at least harvest a couple of does throughout the course of the season. This year I ended up really focusing on hunting areas that I, you know, either had intel on or thought, you know, a mature buck was in the area. And, you know, I really didn't put any uh, true initiative into hunting does early in the season, which I typically do, uh, which I think ultimately made it, you know, increase that stress level when I wasn't able to harvest a buck, you know, during, during bow season or during rifle season. And then I'm still, you know, basically not having any deer in the freezer, uh, you know, by late season. Then that's when kind of those, again, 
like I said, with the, the weather and the pressure and everything like that, it, it made it tough to even harvest a doe. It felt like, again, some of that might have had a little bit to do with some of that burnout that I was experiencing of just, you know, not really, you know, planning out the hunts all that well and not picking my spots all that well. You know, that could have played a factor as well. But this year I did have the most encounters with what I would consider a mature buck. You know, typically what I'm looking at a mature buck is uh, really, you know, to be, if I was honest about it, anything three year, three years old or older. Now, a three-year-old is definitely on that cusp of, you know, is it a mature buck? Is it not? You know, for for target bucks for me, a three-year-old is very much so um, on the table to be, uh, you know, one that I would consider a target buck, uh, especially on uh, on public land. You know, on the on the farm. You know, it would have to be kind of one that I kind of know that I have, you know, either intel on or experience with to make the determination on if it's one that I actually am going to harvest or not. But this year, again, you know, really honed in on a couple of areas that had some a pretty good, or at least a good buck in the area. And I really kind of focused on them. And, it, you know, I was able to kind of pick those areas be more or less in the right spot at the right time it just came down to uh, not being able to capitalize on the opportunities that were presented to me and that's kind of where a lot of my frustration came into and just the I don't even know maybe even a little bit of stress and just anxiety of you know being so close so many times this year and having it not work out in my favor you know I know that you know, it's hunting and things go wrong, but it's one of those things that you just think at some point something's got to go right to, you know, you can't have that many opportunities and mess it up every single time, which, you know, based on how things went this year, you know, that's what it is. So it's, you know, I've, my dad and I have talked about this, you know, repeatedly It's one of the things that we just kind of say it's kind of, you know, that kind of cliche uh, saying is that even if you do everything right, deer still have to make a mistake. And even if you do one thing wrong, then, you know, that could be, you know, that lost opportunity. So you have to have it perfect and they still have to make the mistake. So, so the prime example is, uh, one deer that I, you know, basically it, this is a buck that I had never seen, um, or, you know, in this location, it was on uh, public land where I've hunted, well, I take it back. I didn't really hunt. I've kind of scouted in years past. I ran a camera uh, in that area uh, all of last year or all of the 2022 season. It has some really good intel that basically, you know, bucks and does are cruising this area. And, you know, this year I've, I, again, focused in on that area to hunt, potentially hunt that this season. And, you know, this really nice wide tall eight pointer showed up and this was on uh, October uh, 9th I believe it was actually scratch that it was October 11th when this buck showed up on the 14th I went in there to hunt them basically looking at the same had relatively similar um, weather conditions the wind was out of the same direction temperature was about the same went in there on the tree that I thought was the best one to sit on basically I had uh, basically a 20 to 22 yard shot to a my scrape or not really my scrape an actual scrape that I had found and kind of spruced up earlier in the season and then there's also a couple trails off to basically my right hand side my strong hand so I thought if the deer did potentially use those other trails that I would be able to still get a shot opportunity but I would anticipated that it was going to go out in front of me on this main trail that the scrape was on again if you listen to this uh podcast or listen to the episode where i talk about this you know basically that buck sneaking in and basically appeared right down below me he had basically taken this trail that was only about 10 yards away spooked and missed out my opportunity so it was one of those things where i was i had the right idea i was in the right area but the execution on the tree that i had selected and you know my inability to be able to go undetected in that situation 
um, buggered up my opportunities with it. And it seemed like through a lot of the season, it was just a lot of that, a lot of close, but no cigar. Again, I spent a lot of time, um, you know, during the, the rut on my private piece and it either I just, you know, one of my target bucks I end up uh, seeing, I down with a doe and I just couldn't get uh, the doe to, you know, come my way. I tried calling out the buck, he spooked off and I you know, wasn't able to get a shot opportunity, just basically couldn't get him in range to be able to shoot him. Other times I talked to the landowner who owns the property and, you know, on days I wasn't hunting or had gone somewhere else, he said, yep, sure enough, big bucks were, you know, in the field or they were over in this part of the property. <clears throat> Pulled one of the cameras, you know, later uh, during rifle season, realized that one of another target buck was, you know, hanging out, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, you know, day before opening day for rifle season or another public place piece that I hunt, you know, basically found this spot where there's a, a good, basically like a, a transition area slash kind of like a runway or funnel that funnel a lot of deer movement, a lot of good buck sign, ran a camera, two pretty good bucks, one really good one, ended up shifting where I was hunting or tried shifting where I was hunting and, you know, basically did some insights and scouting, got on to where I figured the bucks were, went to hunt it and you know, basically ended up did my scouting mission, I spooked the really big buck. He's a really big, heavy mainframe eight pointer and a smaller uh, eight pointer is probably about a year younger. I spooked them out of the, the spot. Uh, basically it was one of those deals where, you know, I was doing a little bit of spot and stalk type of thing. And it just, you know, with lack of practice and, you know, know how to being able to, you know, facilitate that um, properly, especially with a bow. You know, of course they spooked off. I ended up having actually a second opportunity at the small of the two. Uh, basically he didn't run off completely. And, uh, you know, while I was you know, messing around my phone, marking some things on the, the, you know, the map, he ended up, you know, spotting me and spooked a second time. Went to that same spot uh, a couple weeks later and ended up, he basically came up and basically ended up in my lap again came from a direction that I wasn't quite expecting he ended up spotting me spooked again so it was just one of those things again getting into where I was the same thing in the right area but the execution and being able to you know pick the exact spot that I was going to be in and to be able to manage you know what to do especially in that close proximity to both those instances where those bucks um, both on public places here were basically you know, right on top of me before I was ready for it. And then kind of looking at the, you know, kind of the progression throughout the course of the season, I'm kind of grading myself on how I did. You know, we're looking at, you know, whether it's, the, you know, talking about the early season, you know, that's an area that I've typically struggled with of uh, being able to, you know, really being able to manage that kind of that, um, behavioral switch or the, the white tail shift or the buck shift when they basically go from velvet to hard horn, you know, you get that, you know, well-defined summer, you know, feed the bed routine. They shed their velvets and they kind of transition that kind of their movement or their patterns of movement a little bit. And I've always struggled to really get on a deer, you know, trying to get, you know, in that situation where you get that opening day buck where you've got them pinned down, you just need to go on there and get them on that first hunt. You know, that's an area where I'm just, that is not my strength and that's not a strong point um, for me in the season. What I really like is the the mid-season or mid-October when we get into that pre-rut. You know, I think that, especially if you've got decent intel on a good buck, if you're getting good camera intel, or if you're catching a buck, um, you know, in daylight, whether that's, you know, just barely, just after, um, you know, first light, if they're still on their feet, you know, going by your camera or going by your stand location, or if you're catching them, you know, getting out of bed early in daylight in the evening, you know, that's, I think one of the easiest way, cause they are still very patternable, I believe, or at least I believe they are, um, during that mid, 
you know, mid-October, that pre-what phrase, they're still kind of doing the typical same thing. Most days they're just kind of cruising, but you just catch them where they're just getting out of bed a little bit earlier or they're heading to bed just a little bit later just because they're doing a little bit more cruising, a little bit more traveling, you know, starting to make some of those rubs, hitting some of those scrapes a little bit more and just kind of moving around a little bit. Again, I'll, you know, I know a lot of the data would suggest is that, you know, temperature doesn't really play much of a factor in, you know, deer movement. But again, you know, if you get that nice cold front, if you get a significant change of temperature, um, or even, you know, if you notice that they move a certain way during a certain wind, you could still capitalize that. Similarly to how I, you know, handled that big eight pointer on the public land that again, botched, but the game plan was solid. You know, I got some intel on this buck, knew that he was in the area. It was just on the edge of just before, um, or it was just, uh, he was still on his feet, basically, um, just in the morning where it was still just enough light. So he was basically still daylighted, um, heading to wherever he was going, probably heading off to bed, but catching him in that, in that location on his feet during legal shooting light. You know, if I started to get those bucks and get, you know, on those camera locations where you get a lot of nocturnal pictures or when they're, you know, still clearly dark and then all of a sudden you start getting pictures of them uh, during those shooting light hours, you know, that's when I really get excited. And, you know, I feel like that's kind of my strong suit in that time frame um, to where I really feel like I got the best chances of, of getting a buck. And then, of course, the rut, you know, the rut's a wild card, um, you know, because you, you never know what's going to happen. You know, the buck that you've been chasing for most of the season are getting intel on, they can disappear. Other bucks are going to show up and their their movement just becomes far more erratic. Now, again, I am a firm believer that a lot of those bucks, uh, especially the mature bucks, um, will repeat the same kind of behavior year in and year out. So if you if a buck shows up, again, for us on our property, we're typically looking at November 7th is kind of that um kind of that time frame where I've gotten a lot of camera intel of the, the same buck returning to the property. But the one thing I will say is that, you know, having hunted, especially on the, the property, um, basically throughout the entire rut. So my entire rutcation, aside from the day and a half that I got sick and wasn't able to go on hunting, I was at the farm, um, basically doing an all day sit, every sit I had or every chance I had. And with that, you know, again, even that property that I've hunted for years now, uh, I learned uh, quite a bit more about it. And again, that felt like, you know, getting that property figured out, just knowing those tendencies of the, you know, those areas that are just going to have that higher chance that deer are going to come through. So you, if you're looking at, you know, a certain food source or um, in my instance, really focusing on the terrain, funneling a lot of that movement. So based on certain cover and, you know, the, the, you know, the hills and valleys of the property itself just seem to have a natural funnel or progression of where those deer are going to kind of focal their movement. The prime example is, is that, you know, in this main field, that's, you know, basically kind of a, basically a 50 acre field of just openness. There's a little valley that cuts through the middle of it and down at one corner, again, a low point where it's actually part of the field that you actually can't till um, because it's just too much water and too much, you know, saturation and whatnot and so you get a lot of forbs different you know shrubs and smaller trees growing in that little area you know i ended up putting a camera there this year to really try to uh, highlight or capture a lot of what that movement is looking like and it's just consistently more movement um, especially just when the deer are trying to get from one end to the property the other they you like to funnel themselves down into that that shallow point and it just seems that you know, it's one of those observations I kind of noticed, uh, you know, over the past couple of years, but really focused in on that this year. And this, you know, for the 2024 season, I'm actually going to have a, a tree stand um, right in the, you know, the heart of that, that, you know, fine point of that focal point at the far end of the field, um, where it just seems whenever deer are trying to cross that field, they take that path, um, you know, almost every time. Uh, at least for the observations I had all of this season. So and the same thing too for, um, you know, on some of the uh, public land spots. I had a spot that I've hunted, uh, you know, not so much this year. I actually kind of 
you know, didn't really hunt that spot this year because a lot of the camera intel just wasn't there. Didn't really show a lot of the deer movement or the buck movement, especially uh, that I've gotten the year before. So this year, you know, it's basically, or I guess the spot, I'll explain that first. It basically is this little, is this small patch of this parcel that just has this little flat point with a patch of white oaks that uh, in the 2022 season produce a lot of acorns and we're dropping and it was just you know lots of doe activity lots of buck activity had two if not three you know potential shooter bucks in that area it just never seemed really to um get on them you know basically it was one of those deals where i hunted one day didn't see the buck that i was going after missed a day hunted the next day and sure enough that buck was there the day i wasn't and caught on camera uh, so this year, I really, again, this year, I really didn't focus on that spot because I just wasn't getting that buck until pulled the camera after that main rut time frame. And sure enough, there was consistent buck movement, basically from the 10th to like the 14th uh, of just bucks just cruising through there. Uh, and two of them, which definitely would be ones I would have been happy shooting. So... You know, with that type of intel, you know, that didn't help me for the, for the 2023 season, but just having that collection of data from those cameras um, is preparing me for, for this next season. You know, I kind of, you know, that's kind of a lot of what this is. It's basically just kind of taking the lump sum of all the information from the season and learning how to apply that to the next season, and especially the rut. Again, it's a wild card deer are going to act crazy they're running around like losing their minds those bucks are those does are trying to find cover and trying to get away from some of those bucks just get away from some of that pressure so you never know but again it's just looking at those trends and you know those areas of you know higher concentration of deer movement you know again you could sit up pretty much anywhere during the rut and potentially kill you know a mature buck or the buck of your you know the target buck or whatever but it's just looking at those odds and those, you know, spots that are going to be um, hedging your bet. <laughs> and then late season, usually late season is, you know, kind of one of my favorites. Uh, that's why I do a lot of my, you know, newer or I'm trying to do a lot, you know, newer things. I'm going out with muzzleloader season, um, you know taking advantage of that snow trying to learn to do tracking to hunt deer so basically cutting a track following deer but again this year that was really a bust we we just didn't have the snow for it and i really struggled uh, you know basically again i think a lot of it had to do with um you know mostly just i think you know i hate to say that it was the weather's fault but it really felt like the weather was not what I'm usually my game plan is for. So when we weren't getting the weather I was anticipating or hoping for, then it kind of shook me a little bit as to what my next game plan was or how would I address this or go go about hunting, um, not getting the weather that I was hoping for. Now, I was able to get on some deer during the muzzleloader season, but again, it seemed like that was a little bit of you know, if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. You know, one of my first sits, it was again, that smaller parcel with those oaks. I was still getting some doe movement through there. So I figured, all right, I'll harvest a doe with the old muzzle loader. I end up, uh, uh, a doe came in, I end up, you know, shooting her. And ultimately I never recovered the deer. You know, I basically tracked her for, I think once my, you know, Part of the tracking app, I tracked her for about nine tenths of a mile. Very little blood. End up finding a, a bed with a little bit of blood in it. You know, basically it was like a little, you know, two inch little diameter, um, you know, sp sp bit of blood. And, you know, from there, basically where she was bedding, there was obviously more deer in there. And, you know, basically when she got up, I lost the, the blood trail and there's just too many tracks to be able to. Um, track her any further you know i was running into situations where i wasn't getting any blood but i was just able to follow her you know her own track and eventually it would catch up you know a bit of blood here or there and just know that i was still on the right track but after the blood dried up and there's just the too many tracks for me to follow i ultimately 
you know, it's one of those things too, if you, if you wound a deer and you don't, you know, recover it, then it's, you know, it's pretty easy to be able to say, well, they're probably still alive. You know, sometimes that may be the case. Sometimes it's not. In this instance, I really do believe that she survived, um, at least initially. And now again, she could always, you know, fall victim to, you know, infection or whatnot, or if it, you know, wounded her enough to where she struggles throughout the winter, that could, I guess, you know, see that that could you know, be something that overtakes her. And yes, ultimately, you know, the shot did kill in the long run, but I really truly believe that that deer survived that shot. I ended up going and double checking the zero on the muzzleloader. Sure enough, it was shooting a good, you know, five to six inches high. So, you know, based on where I was holding, you know, that's very likely that I caught that kind of that no man zone of, you know, up just above the lungs and, you know, got below the spine and it probably just went right through her, you know, basically just, you know, flesh wound really, or not necessarily flesh wound, but didn't hit any vital, vital organs. So I truly think that's what happened um, with that deer. You know, I was really disappointed with that, with how that played out because it was no more than a week prior I had you know, gone through and double checked the, the zero on the muzzleloader and it was shooting good. I, and I, so I don't know what happened as to why the muzzle, why it shot, you know, high, um, got it re-zeroed and then, you know, basically went back to the same spot a few days later, had some more deer come through, had another opportunity, another doe, but that then got ran off by the coyote and, you know, missed out on that opportunity when you know just that frustration of again another you know potential opportunity to harvest the deer and it got got ruined some manner of sorts but again was ultimately able to get a doe off off the the farm and uh got a little bit of meat in the freezer and typically if you know for our household usually about three deer is you know sufficient um you know fortunately i had a really good year last year and so, you know, we do have a little bit of venison left over from the 2022 season. Um, but, you know, I guess the one way I'm going to look at it is that at least it's a good way for me to be able to clean out the freezer and make sure that we're, you know, getting through all that venison from uh, the year before and then not having a, a too big of a stockpile for this year. So I'm hoping for the 2024 season, things go a little bit differently. I have a little bit of our success. Um, but we'll, again, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, you know, with that being said, you know, I'm already kind of thinking about ways to, um, improve for the next season. So again, looking at all the things that went right, all the things that went wrong in regards to the 2023 season. Now looking at how do I utilize that? How do I use that to better myself for the next season? So again, kind of a recap here. You know, the things I did really well, I, I do believe I've gotten better at being able to find deer, especially mature bucks, and, you know, be able to come up with a game plan to be in at least in the right vicinity, uh, more or less in the right time uh, to be able to get an opportunity at these bucks. Now, again, the next part is making sure that I'm ready and prepared for, um, you know, for that. Um, but again, there's some other areas, too, that I think that there's areas of improvement um, that I'm really looking at. So understanding the hunting spots better, you know, that's again, year in and year out, learning just a little bit more about your hunting locations. You know, again, you know, I've hunted at the, this farm, um, for the private piece as far back as I can remember, you know, ever since even before I could hunt going out with my dad hunting this property and still learning just how those deer, uh, move throughout the course of the season, especially when it comes to, um, whether there's crops growing on the property or the adjacent properties, of, if there's crops growing there, how that affects those de that deer movement. When it comes to public land, kind of the same thing. That spot with the white, white oaks, you know, the year before, really good acorn crop, lots of deer movement this year, not so much. But yet, turns out during the rut, those deer were still moving, just learning those trends of how, you know, how those deer are moving throughout the course of the year, even from year in and year out, when some of those variables or some of those conditions change of just kind of taking that consideration and just learning more about your hunting spots every year, that little bit of knowledge or a little bit of, you know, observations, experience 
utilizing that for the next season. The other area that I feel like the main reason why I think I got so discouraged is when, when really focusing on mature bucks, you know, this is again, looking at three year olds, four year olds and older, you know, these guys or those bucks just aren't going to make the mistakes that some of those younger bucks are going to make as, and they're not going to, you know, make the same mistakes as does. Now, again, don't get me wrong. Some of these does that have been around for a few years, you know, they're pretty cagey. They're pretty smart. You know, not much gets by them in regards to they know when something's up. You know, it almost seems like some of those old does just have a sixth sense of there's something going on. Uh, there's danger afoot. But they are still far more predictable and um, forgiving than 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 I than old buck will be you know that buck that uh you know again prime example out on the state land that one that came in from you know came out underneath me he ended up spooking he didn't stick around and you know stare at me he didn't do the you know the typical like doe bob bob and weave to try to figure out something he knew something was wrong when he came out and there was something moving around up on this tree right above him and he didn't stick around for it second time when i had an opportunity at him he just simply chose not to go down that trail that he took the first time. He went out around where, you know, again, basically he, when he spooked that first time, he went out and around up on this other top of this hill and took that trail out and around. The second time I saw him, he was already on the other trail. He wasn't even coming into that main trail that he had taken the first time. <clears throat> so he already had learned and adapted to not take that trail at least I believe so. I mean, it could be that he just simply chose not to take that trail for whatever reason. But I do feel is that he knew that there was something in that area that he didn't like and he wasn't going to chance going, um, you know, taking that same trail he did the first time. Because after that second encounter with him, you know, I didn't see that buck at all the rest of the season. And he didn't show back up again during the, on that camera on the whole rest of the season. So it was a good possibility that he got killed. Um, or he just moved out of the area, again, not having, you know, historical data with that buck outside of that window of, uh, you know, of that, you know, camera catching them, and then my observations while in the stand. <laughs> Which that, again, leads into the other area improvement is picking better tree stand placements. You know, this goes, for again, for both the um, private land or on the public land side. You know, utilizing that information that I got during the course of the rut has made me, you know, think about where I'm going to put my stand locations um, for the 2024 season to be able to capitalize on those areas that does higher deer movement or higher probability of deer movement um, and be able to capitalize on those those locations better. On the public land side, uh, you know, again, it's just, you know, part of it too is uh, looking at some of those mature bucks that like, a lot of times I end up finding myself just in some of the locations I hunt. There's a lot of like red pine or something like that. Something that doesn't have a lot of cover um, to be able to hide you in the tree. And I think that's kind of what kind of sabotaged me a little bit in regards to, um, you know, a couple of those encounters where, you know, it's just one of those things that you just kind of stood out or I stood out just a little bit too much and, you know, didn't have, you know, significant cover around me to hide my movement, to hide, you know, this big blob hanging off this tree. So, you know, looking at, you know, making sure, like, I give up a little bit of, um, you know, the openness to be able to have lots of shooting opportunities and picking a tree that maybe has a little more cover around you, um, maybe, you know, something that's got some branches or um, one thing I'm starting to really like is these trees that have, you know, multiple um, you know, multiple trees coming out of one stump, just the extra, you know, noise around you, uh, at least in regards to having, you know, those other trees or branches just to try to, you know, blend in just a little bit better, really. Another thing too, is I absolutely love having the mobile tree set up. Problem is, is that it is a lot of work to be able to climb in and out and you really find out just how much um, or how you set up all your equipment 
and your gear, if it's efficient and quiet for you, you know, as much as uh, it's nice to be, able to be able to run a gun, you are still making additional noise, additional movements, um, having to, you know, put up and tear down after every sit. And I'm starting to think more and more about potentially doing a few more, you know, stationary uh, sets or permanent sets kind of where, you know, especially on the on the private ground, you know, having your your tree stand set and ready to go. Um, that way, as soon as you get into the spot, you can get up the tree quick and quiet on public land, you know, looking at um, basically at least a few of the spots I know I'm going to hunt repeatedly or ones I feel more comfortable with leaving some of my equipment out there. You know, the big thing was, is, you know, make, maybe just getting the platform set up. So um, either set up a tree stand and just still have my climbing sticks to be able to access the tree stand or the saddle platform just to take a couple of the steps out of um, that whole process. So, you know, again, you can be as quiet as you want, but you are going to be making some noise, make some ruckus a little, you know, a little bit, um, even setting up, you know, with even the best gear, really. You know, you are going to scrape some bark. You're ma just making this a little bit of noise. Um, so maybe potentially cut out some of that um, additional noise and, you know, disturbance with presetting some of those uh some of those locations just to be just a little bit quicker, a little bit quieter. And then the other one that I, I find myself the past two years kind of falling victim to where I, you know, I have, I've scouted during the off season and, you know, kind of highlighting areas that I want to uh, hunt or potential areas I want to hunt. And, getting kind of caught up and just kind of having a little bit of wanderlust of being able, you know, just picking spot after spot after spot after spot and not focusing in, um, you know, when it came down to, you know, again, if you're early season, mid season, during the rut or late season of being able to, you know, kind of separate the wheat from the chaff a little bit and, you know, focus on, okay, this is a good spot. This time frame. this is a good spot. This time frame. this is a good spot. And kind of eliminating some of those other spots that, you know, maybe you had and kind of in your back back pocket a little bit, but you know, focusing on those better spots are just going to give you, um, you know, maybe you just have better intel with or just you know, body of work just consistently better spots to begin with, and focusing on those spots and maybe expand this a little bit more to learn a little bit more about those spots in particular, than to go out and explore new spots. Now, again, you know, there's always that balancing point of, you know, don't get stuck cutting the same spots over and over and over again and burn them out, especially if they're not producing. But then also don't get distracted by some of those other spots that, uh, you know, just don't have a good track record or, uh, you know, may seem like a good spot, but aren't necessarily a great spot. You know, really focus in on some you know, a few good spots than having a bunch of okay spots, I guess, or mediocre spots, maybe even. So again, those are just, you know, now that the season is over, just kind of my, you know, top layer of breakdown of how the season went, what I'm thinking about going forward. You know, there's a lot more that I want to, you know, kind of explore and think about, you know, you know, again, this has been, a, a, I guess, kind of that learning year for me or the close, again, that close Minosa card season where, you know, I was in the game for the vast majority of the season. I just couldn't, you know, make it happen or close the deal on it. So I'm hoping that I can kind of take that, um, you know, kind of that momentum from this season of being so, you know, being able to get on deer, find deer um, and be in the game. And then for this, you know, for the next or for this next season, take that to the next step and actually be able to capitalize on it. <clears throat> you know, that's really, you know, kind of what I'm looking at is just trying to take all those lessons again, take those lessons learned throughout the course of the season, figure out how to apply them for the next season, and how you become better. Um, you know, again, I it 
I've talked about this so many times, but you can put into deer hunting as much as you want. You know, if you are going out there and, you know, going out there scouting, you know, several times, you know, a week and, you know, spending the vast majority of the year thinking about deer and deer hunting and your strategy and how you're going to plan it out and food plots and everything like that, you know, that's great. But then also if you, you know, go out just when you have, if you were, you know, the weekend warrior and hunt just on the weekends when you have the time for it and, you know, the vast majority of the rest of the year, that's not your primary focus. You know, that's great too. So it's so funny that, you know, I've even said it multiple times this season. It's like we go through all this work just for some deer. Uh, but I mean, that's kind of what, again, hammer this point again. You know, that's why it's so much fun. That's why, um, you know, hunting and fishing is so great. So you can, you can put into as much as you want and you can make whatever you want to be. So... But again, that's it for this kind of this wrap up of season. I do um, want to get into some more deeper topics, kind of highlighting some more things, more in detail about um, kind of the, the points of this this episode here. Um, but again, I want to get some other voices in here, get some other opinions on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, these are kind of the, the those quick bullet points of things to I'm again be thinking about and preparing and you know honing in for this next season so so again you know some things to think about throughout, through the course of the year and then again i do hope that i get to uh, see some of you um, at some of the events highlighted again some of the, the information to be able to look into it and if it's something that you can attend or are interested in attending again follow those links down below hope to see you there until next time get out there be safe and have fun